Great. So um, it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Chase. Jennifer is now Associate Provost for the Division of Data Science and, and Information and Dean of the School of Information at UC Berkeley. Before joining Berkeley, Jennifer has been, I should say, the legendary co-founder and leader of multiple inter interdisciplinary labs of Microsoft Research, including a tiny lab in Israel. <laughs> um, Jennifer is very decorated with many awards for both leadership and scientific contribution. So I should say Jennifer is, um, is a scientist and a leader and, a, and, and has a lot of vision. Uh, so maybe I'll stick to the convention of this workshop and just skip all the awards. Um, so when I asked Jennifer to give a keynote talk in this event, she replied with what I should have guessed she would say, uh, let's talk. And then the following day, we are having a Zoom conversation, with, which starts with, with my very modest request to Jennifer to talk about some of her work on algorithmic fairness. And within minutes, it ends with a topic that goes way beyond algorithmic uh, fairness and features an amazingly multidisciplinary panel of leading figures in social sciences, computer science, social welfare, sociology, public health, and medicine. So Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes, and then I'm going to introduce my, my panel to you, and we'll get started with the panel. Uh, so, um, so as Michal said, you know, at, at first, when I was invited to this a while ago, and it was supposed to be a full week, I thought, okay, I'll talk about work in algorithmic fairness, bias in bios, things like that. Um, many of the computer scientists here have visited my labs that I had at Microsoft for many years, um, where we had just an incredible group in fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics. Uh, who worked closely with, uh, with many of the scholars here. Um, but, you know, when I decided to come, why did I decide to come to Berkeley, okay, and leave those wonderful labs? I decided to come to Berkeley because um, I wanted to go beyond uh, the scholarly pursuits. I mean, it sounds strange to say Microsoft has scholarly pursuits. <laughs> You know, but but really, a lot of what we were doing were scholarly pursuits. It was wonderful because we had reality coming towards us all the time um, in in terms of the online world. But I, the opportunities here are so great, and there are amazing scholars in not only computer science, but also law and how it interacts with technology, like Deirdre Mulligan and Pam Samuelson and others who were here. But when I got here, I realized there was even more than that that we should be thinking about. And um, I started talking before COVID times. <laughs> So before COVID and Black Lives Matters with Linda Burton, who's one of our panelists. And, you know, and I, and I wondered what can we do to get from a lot of the questions we're thinking about in algorithmic fairness to really um, having a social impact. And that also meant working with the practitioners, the people on the ground who are dealing with the lack of a just world with, with the inequities. So, um, you know, Berkeley is just so rich in this area. We have a graduate school of education that you know is trained over a thousand K through 12 teachers who deal with the reality of that system. Um, Linda is the dean of the School of Social Welfare. We train lots of the social workers in this state who deal with you know everything that is missing in our social welfare system and the fallout of the fallout of the inequities. 
We also have a school of public health here, which, um, which trains our public health workers. Um, and, you know, um, there, there had been last fall a paper that Ziad Obermeyer, who's one of our panelists, had done with Sendil, uh, uh, Sendil Mulanethian, and oh my, I've forgotten his name now, but one of John Kleinberg's students, um, uh, on um, racial disparities in healthcare. And that came out sometime in the fall. It was featured in the New York Times. And then we all saw those inequities play out in the way COVID disproportionately affected uh, certain racial groups and economic groups. And so what I really want to do, I feel like we are bringing together um, the, the people from these fields and the people who are training the folks in these fields who can help us to understand better what the real problems are. So not have, as I had said to, um, uh, to Reddy yesterday, these drive-by collaborations, but you know, really, um, really immerse ourselves. But this is very much a work in progress. We are just starting this. And so I would love to have many of you join us in this. Now I will tell you about the members of my panel. Um, the first is Reddy to Baby, who um, many of you heard this morning. Uh, her talk so beautifully set this up. I thought she was gonna talk about something more specific in her fairness work. And she really set up um, the reason why we are trying to, to do this. So she's a computer scientist in AI and algorithms and social justice and machine learning for, for social good. She's a junior fellow at Harvard. Um, and I am thrilled that a year from now she will be joining us as a faculty member in EECS and as one of the leaders in helping to build this new area here. Uh, okay, next. So, ready, just say hi so that people at least see your face if you're not on. Hi it. again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next is Linda Burton. Um, Linda is the Dean of the School of Social Welfare. Uh, she just joined Berkeley a year ago from Duke. She is a professor of sociology and she specializes in family structure and poverty and inequality and in child development. Next, so say hi Linda so that you're- Good morning up on everyone. <laughs> okay, next is John Eason. John is joining us from University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he is an associate professor of sociology and the director of the University of Wisconsin Justice Lab. Before John was a scholar, he was a community organizer. He organized for state Senator Barack Obama <laughs> way back when. So John has gone from being a practitioner to being a scholar. His work focuses on criminal justice, more broadly on uh, 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 community health and race and punishment and the rural urban divide. So John, why don't you say hi? The space bar is supposed to let you temporarily unmute. It didn't work yeah. for me. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Next is Marzia Rassami. Um, Marzia is jointly, she's, uh, 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 she's a junior faculty member, um, an assistant professor, jointly in computer science and medicine at University of Toronto. She does machine learning and computational medicine. She holds both a Canada Research Chair and a CIFAR AI Chair. And in addition to doing, you know, um, healthcare NLP for medical records, she also looks at inequality 
in healthcare. And uh, she's actually really pushing me. We are, oh yes, one other thing we're doing, which is very exciting, is we are building a joint school with UCSF on machine learning and AI for clinical care. And uh, Marcia is, is pushing me. I am on a lot of UC, um, UC wide committees. I'm on the committee, the steering committee for governance over healthcare data. And Marcia is pushing me to try to open up that data so that we can discover um, you know, what, what is missing in our healthcare. And then finally, we have Ziad Overmeyer. Ziad is an associate professor in the Berkeley School of Public Health. He is actually a medical doctor, an emergency room doctor. Um, although for the last several years, he on the side trained himself in <laughs> machine learning. And he has been, um, he's, he's one of the leaders in uh, 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 machine learning for healthcare. And I had mentioned his article from last fall, which um, in a sense, uh, in a sense, predicted what would happen in a pandemic. I mean, that wasn't the intent of it, but it just played out as a perfect prediction of what he had found. So those are my panelists. Um, what I would like to do is I'd like to get to know each of them a little better. So I would like each of them to spend you know, a few minutes, five minutes, telling us a little bit about themselves, their background and their work, and why they think it is important to build a community of scholars and practitioners together as we consider um, fairness and social justice. So, uh, in alphabetical order, let's start with Rediet, although she, we, we heard a lot this morning from her, but maybe just a few more minutes and then we'll move on to Linda. Sounds great. Um, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you everyone for sticking around for this panel. I think we started a lot of interesting discussions earlier this morning and I'm happy that we'll have an opportunity to continue some of those threads. So you, you saw a bit about my research uh, this morning, so I won't repeat it, um, but I'll say that you know, I work on a mix of uh, theoretical, uh, th theoretical applications and also sort of uh, on the AI side as well, sort of applications of machine learning. But more than that, what I'm really focused on is, um, is helping in issues related to poverty and inequality, right? So really I try to work on problems where I start with the problem and then I see what techniques that I might need. And that's led me to do sometimes very theoretical stuff and sometimes very applied stuff. And I sort of just work my way backwards. And I think that that's actually something that we as a community could do more of. I think a lot of times we, um, we have our set of techniques or tools that we really like and we sort of develop them and we maybe use language that makes it seem like the work could be applicable but then in reality, when we go out there, it's actually like, it's not quite the right fit, right? So it's a sort of like, you know, you have your hammer and you're looking for a nail sort of, sort of analogy. And I think we really need to flip that on its head and think about what it would look like if we were to start with a domain, really try to understand that domain, uh, know the people in that domain, build relationships, build trust. And I appreciate what Martha said this morning about actually coming in with humility about, you know, whether you're actually needed at all. It might be the case that uh, that you're not, and and then having that guide the kind of research that we want to do. So I think that uh, is something that's incredibly important that I hope we'll get to talk more about. Um, so with that, I'll stop because I got a chance to speak a lot this morning, and I'm excited to see how this conversation evolves. Okay, so next, my partner in crime, Linda. We are we are building the theme of human welfare and social justice. That at Berkeley in our new division, which by the way, I wanted to tell you it's no longer called data science and information. It is computing data science and society. That is the official name of the new division. 
Okay, Linda. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, as I begin my comments, I want to send out a special thank you to Jennifer for her collegial spirit, her just willingness and mission to mentor others and to bring others along. And most importantly, for your friendship, Jennifer, uh, you are amazing. And I'm really happy to know you and to be able to work with you. <laughs> So it's Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to do, we are truly partners in crime and we are going to do amazing things. I just know that. Um, so as Jennifer indicated to you, I'm the new Dean of the School of Social Welfare at Berkeley. And I, I come here as the new Dean, as the, I'm a sociologist by training, which is often an, an unusual uh, discipline to, uh, in terms of leading a school of social welfare. So what that means is I have the bird's eye view on in my position as Dean and as a sociologist on practice. So I get a chance to see what's going on on the ground with uh, uh, indiv individuals in the communities that we serve as well as the training of our students to be able to do that. But in addition to that, I bring the, the scholarship along with it as well, and scholarship about social relationships. I'm very theoretically oriented, and uh, I love all kinds of methodological uh, perspectives. Uh, in fact, I'm what you might call a, a big scientist type of uh, sociologist, and what that means is I, I really thrive on opportunities to do collaborative research, to do interdisciplinary research. Um, I've been involved in some of the largest studies, for example, of welfare reform and its impact on families uh, using mixed methods uh, approaches, one of the largest uh, studies in the country on that. So uh, that's important to keep in mind as uh, we move forward uh, in our initiatives here. But methodologically, I would have to describe myself as an ethnographer. And what that means is I study context. And um, I look at change at, over time in, in individuals and in social relationships, um, in institutions. I look at those things over time because I'm not uh, studying families at say I go to visit them one day and that's it. Uh, the longest time I've ever been uh, engaged in studying uh, families on particular studies that I've worked in is seven years. So I get to learn seven years intently of those individuals' lives. And in doing so, I pay considerable attention to what people say and how that might like look different from what they actually do. So I'm very curious to see what comes out in our collaborations in terms of how we're able to capture that. The, uh, the consistency between what people say and what they actually do. Because we all know that oftentimes the devil is truly in the details when we look at these particular issues and that nuances are extremely, extremely important as we think uh, about understanding uh, not only un, un, uh, human behavior, but the behavior of, of institutions as well. What are those nuances that we might not necessarily be able to capture with surveys or certain types of data, but may have really critical explanatory value in terms of us understanding outcomes? So uh, I know one of the first questions Jennifer proposed to uh, us, and I'll, I'll say, deal with this very, very quickly. I wanted to say that in building collaborations, we all have to understand that we bring very, sometimes very different currencies to the table, but that all of our currencies have value. And as I look at the currency that we as individuals in social welfare, and sociology bring to the table. We currently right now bring a currency that is extremely important in the world order and how we move through that. And that is the social, social consciousness that we bring on the ground about issues of social justice uh, and, and, and fairness. 
And specifically right now, as we deal with those issues around race. Um, in addition to that, I'll just uh, end with saying as we move forward in collaboration, some other uh, points that I think are important for us to consider that you probably have already covered in the conference is our language and how we understand the language of our disciplines and how we relay that to each other and explain it to each other so that we're able to communicate effectively around the issues that are most important to us. Um, the framing of the work that we do. What is the theoretical uh, approaches that we use in the, in the work that we do? And how do we use the inductive and deductive will? How do we, will, how do we go back and forth um, asking questions, addressing questions, both inductively and deductively to come at new perspectives and addressing the issues? It's also important that we don't see each other as add-ons to any project, that we're all in and in, in real time and very dedicated uh, to our projects right at the beginning, that none of us are add-ons, uh, that we are also are inclusive in uh, including the communities that we work in, members of the community. Uh, in our, the work that is done so that they only not uh, help or actually develop some of the questions, research questions that are actually addressed, but that their feedback on whatever answers come from those questions are also uh, incorporated in the interpretation. And finally, that we also look at multiple levels simultaneously. I have always been intrigued by uh, the work that allows us to look at individuals, social relationships, context, institutions, and public policy simultaneously uh, to give us a better sense of how those factors might interact with uh, respect to uh, shaping uh, outcomes that are important for the betterment of mankind. So I'll stop right there and thank you so much. Thank, I'm, I'm here, Jennifer. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I want to first thank Jennifer for the uh, for being invited here. Um, I also want to acknowledge Linda Burton, who was uh, my postdoc mentor at Duke, who um, gave my uh, research trajectory a whole different uh, bend from uh, the moment I met her forward. Uh, I was able to figure out. Uh, uh, a very a, a very difficult discipline to uh, navigate. Um, so I want to acknowledge and thank both Jennifer and Linda. Um, Linda actually covered several of the topics I was going to hit on. So I'm going to give a little more personal account of uh, who I am and what why uh, my experience is important for understanding algorithms. Um, we all know that uh, six in ten, uh, six in ten Americans either know someone or has a family member incarcerated, or has a, or someone who has been incarcerated. For African Americans, it's nine out of ten. Long before these reports were produced, I grew up black in America, so I, I understood this, and this is actually what drove my research agenda, and drove me uh, to be a community organizer. I actually started organizing on the uh, south side of Chicago at the age of 22, hoping to uh, reform housing and the criminal justice system. What I found was that uh, at that period, it was difficult to go beyond what was just on the ground. So I began asking questions uh, in terms of the small research actions we were doing that led me into grad school. Uh, about why we were producing so many people, uh, partly why we were sending so many people to prison. Um, and the answer was simple. Most people said, oh, it's an economic answer. It's about jobs. And in fact, I start my book, Big House on the Prairie, Rise of the Rural Ghetto uh, and Prison Proliferation uh, with uh, a community action um, and a reflection on uh, some of the work we were doing. 
at that time where we were closing drug houses on the south side of Chicago. And uh, at the end of one of these uh, marches where we had a police commander agree to shut down one of the drug houses, this was about our fifth at the time, um, a, a, a older gentleman uh, stated that we were simply sending our black children from our neighborhoods downstate in Illinois for white workers to get jobs. Um, this is what inspired me to go back to school um, to, to figure this puzzle out. Was this in fact true? And I, I began collecting data uh, on every prison ever constructed in the US. I now have the largest and most complete data set uh, through the Prison Proliferation Project. Uh, where I know where every prison is and when it opened, uh, all, seven, all 1,663 facilities. I got so interested in this that I took my wife and two small children to rural Arkansas to study the place called Forest City and reconstruct their social history as to why they built the prison. Now, what does any of this have to do with big data, you'd ask? Well, I'm a multi-method researcher and the, what some people may call me-search, uh, that's researching yourself in a way, or using qualitative methods, which seem less rigorous and more slippery and less accurate. Uh, I actually argue uh, it allows you to be more reflective, reflexive, I should say. It allows you to be more reflexive and actually interrogate data in a way that you might not uh, using other methods. I, in fact, use uh, reflexivity and quantitative analysis. So um, I think there's a lot that uh, we can all learn from each other. There's a debate right now in the criminal justice field. Uh, there's a recall uh, on algorithms themselves uh, as part of the call to defund the police. So I'm going to save my comments on that for when we get into those questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, Marzia. Hi, everyone. Uh, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, <laughs> so the reason that I got interested in health as a machine learning person uh, is actually because I was uh, talking to my uh, doctor friends in Boston and they were telling me uh, you know, stories about being in clinical situations and not knowing what to do. And I thought, well, don't you, you, know, don't you have evidence? Don't you have guidelines that you can sort of leverage in these situations? And they gave me a lot of clinical literature that I was not aware of at the time being a computer scientist, demonstrating that there often is not very much evidence on what makes sense for all patients in given situations, randomized controlled trials are very spotty. And then even worse, as I discovered later on in my PhD, often randomized controlled trials are very biased. And so the evidence that we have about how to treat people is based on populations that are convenient to recruit or that the recruiter feels are most representative of humanity. So young, white, college educated men. So this is problematic because when we talk about the uh, you know, machine learning revolution in healthcare, there's sort of this assumption that medicine is a science. This is an objective field of study. We have ways that we treat people. Um, there are known effects and causes that we can leverage. And maybe it's like computer vision. Maybe if we have enough pictures and we show enough dogs, we could have people label these dogs and then we could have an algorithm learn to detect dogs. But that's not the situation that we're in. The setting is very different. Here we have images, case reports, examples, EHR data, all of these things very heterogeneous that sometimes have bias embedded from the get-go. Everything from what questions are funded to be studied in clinical medicine, there's very little done on endometriosis. It affects one portion of the population. Going further to once you're studying a problem, what kind of graduate students are hired to study that problem? What kind of papers get published? What kind of people can participate in your clinical research studies? 
So whether we're talking about retrospective data analysis for healthcare or prospective data collection in clinical trials, bias is baked in because doctors, researchers, scientists are humans and humans are biased. There's so much bias in this system. I do think that there's a huge opportunity for people in machine learning to actively engage in the domain, understand how deeply rooted bias is in medicine and how specifically in North America, it has been deployed against indigenous communities and people of color historically. There are horrible examples that are in every textbook and many that are not recorded in textbooks. I think that we can potentially not make things worse. But one of the things that I believe very strongly is if people who do machine learning don't engage very deeply in the domain in healthcare, we will make things much worse. So it's not a given that all of this automation, optimization, prediction, counterfactual estimation is not going to make things worse for very specific portions of the population. Uh, so I, the last thing I want to say is this was really driven home to me by a student who still comes to every talk I give uh, and asks the same question. She, she comes to every single talk here in Toronto. And at the end, she says, can you give me one example of when it is to my advantage to report my gender and my race, she's a black woman, to an algorithm where I will get something better? In a, tell, give me an example in finance, in education, in healthcare. I have yet to come up with an example of when her providing her race and her gender to an algorithm would benefit her. And until we can answer those questions, I think there's a lot of conversation and soul searching and really deep embedding in the domain that has to happen with people who work in machine learning, algorithmic fairness, and in these domains. Thank you, Marcia. So finally, we turn to Ziad, who, as I said, is actually a doctor and a machine learning researcher. And in this stunning article, I feel predicted what we saw with COVID. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I think that's uh, far too kind to the work. Um, but, but I will say, um, I, I wanted to just share one tidbit uh, with you guys from this article, because I think it um, I think it illustrates the the kind of research that I I do and that I, I think is really important to do. Um, the 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 basic um, point of the article is that uh, we were studying an algorithm that was used to uh, allocate an extra help program to people who needed it. So the the algorithm was trying to find people who needed help with their health. And to find people who had um, big health needs, they did something that actually sounds very reasonable, which is they found people who had large health costs. And the reason that that sounds reasonable is because in general, um, when you're sick, you go to the hospital and you generate costs. And in general, the more costs you generate, the sicker you are. Um, the problem is that when you're black in America or when you're poor um, in America or anywhere, you don't get the same level of access to the healthcare system when you need it. And so even though on average, sick people cost money, um, on average, sick black people cost less money than sick white people. Um, and, and that has its roots in a number of structural factors about our society and our healthcare system. It has its roots in the fact that doctors treat people differently because of the color of their skin. Um, but whatever it is, it translates into this um, fact that conditional on health, black patients have lower costs and an algorithm that simply predicts costs is going to build in that structural disadvantage um, that black patients face. So why do I bring up that um, fact? Well, I think it illustrates a certain kind of problem that's really, really important for us to solve that we see in lots of different fields from criminal justice to uh, hiring and, and, and labor economics to, to health. And so the problem that we were studying was on one hand, a very technical problem about measurement error, like the difference between a proxy variable that we have and a latent variable that we care about. Um, it's about covariance structures between health and cost and rate. So, you know, it has many technical features, but on the other hand, it's about a deep question 
which is how do we measure health? What is health? How do race and poverty condition our access to care? Um, and, and so how we formulate a problem, and, and I think I saw uh, Salon was, was here somewhere, although I don't see him on my big gallery of Zoom people. Um, he's described it uh, as, as how we formulate a problem. And that is fundamentally a multidisciplinary rich thing that requires both of those skill sets. And so, you know, I, I have a lot of collaborations with people that I've learned a lot from. And I think when people think about interdisciplinary collaborations, like, you know, if one of you wanted to collaborate with me, I think like, you know, the dominant way we think about these is like, okay, well, I'm, I'm the doctor on the project and I contribute some, you know, substantive knowledge and then someone else does the math. Um, and, and I actually think that that's fundamentally the wrong way to think about these problems. Um, and the proof of that is that, you know, we stumbled on this large scale bias in an algorithm um, that was being used to make decisions for like tens or possibly hundreds of millions of people in the US alone. Um, the data scientists that developed that algorithm did not catch it. The uh, doctors and public health, public policy people who bought the algorithm didn't catch the problem. The doctors who applied the algorithm to their patients didn't catch it. The patients didn't catch it themselves. So you can't just rely on like engaging people to solve these kinds of problems. This requires enormous investment on both sides. So that means that, you know, um, uh, when you look at like Marzia's work, which is, you know, uh, some work that I know well, Marzia has made enormous investments in learning about health. I have made enormous investments learning about math. And uh, as most of you know, doctors are generally innumerate. And so uh, like that's despite everything about medical education that kind of tries to beat the math out of you. Um, but, but it's a huge investment on, on both sides. Um, and so I, I wanted to bring that up because I think that that's, I think fundamentally what is um, wonderful about the work that is going on at Berkeley, the, the collaborations that I've been involved in outside of Berkeley as well. And I think what it means is that, you know, when we think about how we diagnose and fix problems and algorithms, you know, our, our work suggests that the difference between um, a good algorithm that, you know, is fundamentally progressive and reallocates resources to people who need them and a bad algorithm that is regressive and, and gives more to the people who have more already is a series of very small technical choices that really, really matter. And you can't see those and you can't make those choices correctly unless you really, really know both the content area and also some of these technical um, skills along with it. Thank you, Ziad. I, this, um, this causes me to mention one thing that is very exciting about our new division of computing data science and society, which is something called the data science commons, which is going to be um, a multidisciplinary home for scholars. So everybody you see here, um, it, it has a certain amount of risk tolerance. The, the five people who spoke here have some risk tolerance in that they decided to make choices in their careers that um, were not the fastest route to success. They're successful anyway, because they're awesome. But you know, you tend to follow the straight and narrow, and especially, you know, pre-tenure, people really often, you know, they're, they're advised to follow the straight and narrow because, you know, you want to get tenure in one department, you have to talk to the people in that field, you have to publish in the appropriate venues for that field. And then when we go to hire people also, there are a lot of people with a background in computing who, unless they are advancing the state of the art in computing, will not necessarily get a job at a top three department in computing. And I'm sure the same is true in other fields. I mean, if you're a sociologist and you're spending all your time doing machine learning, they probably wouldn't like that either. And so what, what we are doing is we are creating groups within this data science commons. We are trying to define 
what it means to be a deep multidisciplinary scholar and to use that definition and to de-risk so that if someone hasn't published exclusively in a particular field, we are recognizing them for having impact. Right now we have an educational system which discourages impactful work of this sort, at least among junior scholars. And, uh, and so I think it's really important that we give people like Ziad time to learn the math and the machine learning and people like Marzia time to learn the, the, um, the medicine and people like John time to, you know, to, to really um, learn these, these different disciplines, both the kind of anthropological and the more quantitative and ready it to venture out into more what might be viewed as philosophical questions rather than, you know, to, I mean, thank goodness we're starting to get a few computer science conferences that, that allow this, but, um, but I think that it's very, very important. Um, now, I don't know, I, I had, you know, a few other questions I was gonna ask. I, I get the impression that John was gonna um, answer a question about algorithms. So maybe we let him do that now about, you know, what, what we should be thinking about as we, um, as we uh, create algorithms and what we as you know, people who write algorithms should, should be thinking about. And then maybe we'll just open it up because I think we have some amazing panelists here. So John, answer, answer the, the question, you, the, give, give us the answer you were postponing and then so we'll, we'll open it up. <laughs> the answer I was postponing was simply <laughs> that people live in your error term. There are people that actually live there and you need to consider them in the context in which they live. So we talk about a criminal justice system, for example, as if it's one thing, and it's actually not just the 50 states each have a system. Um, there are 3,100 counties, more than 3,100 counties and more than 26,000 US census places. So that goes to the multi-level nature of any analysis you do and that's on a national scale right um and so i i consider context the same way linda does um but i do it at a different at different units of analysis that's why i didn't want to repeat a lot of what she was saying but there are people in your error term and you have to consider them and i think being reflexive which means uh not announcing your bias to the world, but working through your own sets of biases and then learning to mitigate them. For example, um, if I can go on for one more minute, uh, I thought I thought that most, like, like many of you probably still do, I thought that most prisons were private. They were built in uh, poor rural white communities. And actually most prisons are public. Uh, there, most prisons are run by states. 82% of them are run by states. And as you increase the percent Black and Latinx in a rural community, the probability of getting a prison increases. If I wasn't open to uh, admitting th these biases I had, I wouldn't have been able to find the counterfactuals, uh, which sort of set my research agenda down a whole different path. And if we aren't willing to be reflexive and say, hey, this is what I actually think. Um, and then say, hey, I was wrong and it, learn from that. I don't think uh, we're gonna be able to push forward much. Thank you, John. So I was going to ask more questions, but you know, we only have about 15 more minutes. Um, I wonder if there are questions or comments. I mean, someone can just write comment or question in the chat and, uh, and then I'll, I'll call on you if you, if you want to do it that way. If not, we, we have more questions um, ourselves. So 
No questions or, or comments. I can also just jump in. I wanted to add. Yes, one please yeah. do. Please Let me do. just jump in. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I appreciate um, everything that's been said on this panel. There's so much actually that I want to respond to, but I'll just have to follow up with you one-on-one. -on -one. But one thing that I really, I, I really think we have to talk about this is the issues of representation, right? So going back to what you said, Ziad, about um, how you needed to be trained both as a sort of as a doctor and as a machine learning researcher to see these issues. You know, sometimes I see those types of papers and I'm like, yeah, of course that happened. You know, like, so when we saw like the Amazon resume screening that was like, oh, we removed people's gender. And so we removed their name, so it's totally fine. And, and I was just like, no, it's not fine. Clearly you did not have a woman in that room or a woman who was empowered enough to speak because we would be able to see immediately all the other ways in which our gender would show through in our, in our resumes. And I think what you're saying, Ziad, about, um, about your work, which I think is incredibly important. Um, and you were saying, you know, you had to have had this like medical training and machine learning training to see that issue. I think it would have also sufficed if you had machine learning training and you were a black person, right? If I was um, dealing with one of these algorithms and I was told, this is how we're gonna predict stuff, I would just be like, um, I, are you aware of structural racism? Like this is clearly gonna be an issue, right? And so I think there's this tendency where like we're starting to value multidisciplinary collaborations. We have a long way to go, but we're starting to value them. I think that's really wonderful, but I think we don't see people's lived experiences as a kind of expertise. And we try to find like these like weird workarounds to just sort of say, we don't exactly need those communities here. If we just had the right combination of the different disciplines, then maybe that would sort of cover it. And I don't think that kind of proxy representation is something that we should stand for anymore. I think we should all be working very hard to make sure that those that are being directly affected are actually leading the conversations, not just being checked in on every so often, but actually leading the conversations. Comments from other panelists on this? I mean, I think it's, it's very important as I look over the Berkeley faculty, for example, well, just, you know, all faculty, right? It's not just Berkeley by any means. Ready, it showed us the statistics this morning in computer science. What was it, like 23, right? Yeah, I mean, well, like 13 yeah. graduates, Black graduates in 2000, in, in the year you got your degree, yeah, and, right? And, and 23, uh, full professors and yeah, going up from like 2.1 to 2.9% on black professors of computer science as you go, you know, from full down to associate, down, down to assistant professor. Yes. And it's just, it's, um, yes. And I think that we do not, I mean, there's something else that I believe about, um, you know, not uh, about being a minority of any sort. I hear sometimes that uh, I'll just personalize it to women since that's my experience, okay? <laughs> in the four years I was at Princeton, no other woman got her PhD in math or physics. The few who were ahead of me all dropped out. <laughs> yes, it was. And, you know, and people say, oh, and then when they get tenure, you know, everyone just throws all these things at them. They get all these grants, they get, and it's like, no. You know, um, the, the people who got to the tenure stage have been subject to a much stronger process of natural selection <laughs> or unnatural selection, okay? And so if you were looking at you know, if, if you were comparing what the top woman in a field like particle physics got to the top five to 10% of the men, which was the appropriate ratio, you'd say, yeah, that's comparable. So, so I think that um, there is just not enough appreciation of um, what someone who is the only or nearly the only 
has to go through to get there. And we don't sufficiently take that into account as, as we choose which scholars we are going to bring into our communities. I mean, I'm sorry, I know I'm preaching to the choir here probably, but anyway, that's my, Jennifer, that's my Kira, sense. Kira Goldner has a question. Great, Kira. And then in Bal has a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so my question was about, uh, for Ziad or anyone else, about like the level of collaboration of doing each other, you know, learning each other's disciplines that you think is necessary. For example, I had a recent collaboration um, of, you know, using theoretical computer science to model and understand health insurance markets where we collaborated with um, a, domain, a domain expert in health insurance markets, but he didn't do any math. And I do not know everything about health insurance markets. We, you know, had some meetings and he, you know, we talked back and forth and learned how to talk to each other. And I learned something about health insurance markets. And he, you know, we explained to him our model and helped make sure that he thought it was a good model. But again, he didn't do any math and I am not an expert on health. And so, I guess like where in between completely separating the process with little discussion versus, you know, the doctor doing the math, do you think is the right balance in order to really get at the problem and understand the issues? Well, I'll just go first, but uh, if anyone else has thoughts on this, I, I don't I don't think it's a um I don't think it's an easy question to answer because I, I do think it'll just be so context dependent. Um, I'll, I'll maybe like give you a, a concrete example from from one field that I've gotten more exposure to, um, which is uh, if you think about the example of behavioral economics, um, you know the the thing that made that field work was that a bunch of economists started taking the psychology literature very seriously, um, and a bunch of psychologists also started learning how to write down the kind of concepts that they had been used to expressing in kind of words in kind of, you know, um, things that look more like Greek letters. And, and so I think, um, you know, that, that field proved to be an amazingly successful example, but I think there are, there are other ones. Like I think um, applied math is another really great example of like people taking applied problems seriously and then learning about their own theoretical problems from that. So I think that you know there there's a there's a nice feedback loop that that can develop, um, but but I do think it's um, I would say that the reason it's very costly to do multidisciplinary work is because the the level of investment is huge. It's like it's you know for me at least it wasn't just working on a paper, it was spending years like like doing problem sets in textbooks by myself. Um, it was reading a bunch of papers in the areas that I was interested in. So it, it's it's very costly. And I think we wouldn't we wouldn't want to minimize that. Like we have to be realistic about that. And, and as Jennifer was saying, we have to create the structures that are friendly to, to those kinds of big investments. Because realistically, I think um, I'm not saying you can't write a great paper in a kind of standard collaboration model. But I think if you really want to push forward um, something that's fundamentally new and different, uh, you know, the, the, this market is pretty efficient. If it were easy to do, that paper would already been have been written. And so the fact that that paper is not written is indicative of how much investment you need to make to get there. Inbal has a question. Uh, right. I wanted to ask, what would you advise a pre-tenure faculty who are not at Berkeley and don't enjoy this uh, open-mindedness uh, want to do multidisciplinary work? Uh, you should just move to Berkeley. That's <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was it. <laughs> I've just been doing it one person at a time. You know, I'll do all 70 people, 61 people on this call. <laughs> Yeah, I, I look, I think, honestly, um, I, I think it's a it's, you know, it, it's personal risk tolerance, I think you, you know, we, we have to build the structures that de risk it. 
Um, we really, really do. And, you know, different people have different comfort levels with risk. I mean, I dropped out of high school and lived on the streets of New York City. So somehow, <laughs> you know, taking a risk and maybe not getting a job in mathematical physics at Princeton wasn't going to kill me. You know, um, I, I think that, it, you know, um, it, it is hard. I think you should look as you're looking for jobs, you should look for environments where mm -hmm. There are people who are going to support you. I think that um, it's very helpful to have a senior scholar or two out there, either at your institution or someplace else, who can support you in this. And I think you should realize it might take a little longer. I mean, Ziad said he had to go and you know do all these problem sets, and you know I just worked twenty four seven. You know, everybody told me I wouldn't get a job and three and a half years out of grad school, I got seven tenured offers because I had worked that hard because, you know, but I probably killed my health. I was, I was working like 22 hours a day, you know, um, but it, it's just, I think it's a matter of how, how risk tolerant you are. And there are people who become wonderful multidisciplinary scholars after they get tenure and it's a little safer and that's okay too. You know, but I think this community, in fact, mm -hmm. of as, as you were talking about deep collaborations, I was looking at this community and I think the algorithms folks and the, and the legal scholars here and the philosophers have really been talking very deeply now for a number of years. And there are conferences that are growing up and they have created this field now with the journals and everything and the publication venues that do risk sit a little bit. And I just hope that here we can do that more broadly. We can, you know, do this in the areas of social welfare and public health and, public education and and that we can create this group of scholars who look at the world this way, starting with undergraduates. We have an amazing data science program where I, I wanna start undergraduates thinking this way before they know there's something they should be scared about <laughs> when it's all new. Can I say Let's one, one Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm Stacey Dogan. I'm from, from Boston University. And I, I just wanted, I, I think this is kind of a pivotal moment for these questions. I think many institutions are beginning to think hard about how to solve this very problem. So BU just established a um, faculty of computing and data sciences that is trying to do exactly the same thing that Berkeley is trying to do. Um, and if anyone is interested in um, getting to know the people in that group, please reach out to me directly or Ron Kennedy, who is also um, in, this, um, in this session. Um, and uh, we are also, I think someone mentioned yesterday, uh, we're partnering with Georgetown in a project to put together a a white paper with guidance on both sort of pedagogical innovations as well as structural innovations within universities who are innovating in the law and technology space like at the intersection of law and computer science. Um, and um, again, uh, we had sort of an early workshop in April. We were supposed to have another conference um, this summer that will probably take place in August. But if anyone is um, either interested in sharing your insights um, with us on either pedagogy or structural innovation um, or interested in hearing from us, again, please um, reach out to one of us um, and we'd be happy to bring you into the conversation. I'm going to say one thing and then turn it over to Linda. Bob Brown, your president, called me and tried to get me to take that job instead of this job. He's a good guy. He thinks very broadly. And I think he's doing very cool things there. And I think Azair, who is your dean, is wonderful. Um, so come to Berkeley or be you. Um, <laughs> OK, and Linda, what? Can I say yeah. briefly, as somebody who's who's not at, at Berkeley or VU, um, uh, but somebody who went to graduate school at MIT before there was sort of this IDSS that there is now, um, it, if you want to engage in these problems, Jennifer is right, you, you need to have a higher risk threshold, but you also need to be very comfortable with having awkward conversations. 
And if you have uh, high quality people at your institution, I think that they will acknowledge that the silence is awkward and then they will make changes. Uh, and I went through a set of these where I would ask a question, well, why can't I have this? Well, why is this not a policy? Why is this not standard? Um, the silence is awkward. And then they would come back weeks later and there would be a new policy or they would offer a different project. So I, I think you do have to have risk tolerance. You also have to be very comfortable making other people uncomfortable. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think all of us are. Um, Linda had a Linda had something she wanted to say here. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. I just wanted to add from the perspective of someone who's really interested and committed to, to mentorship to remind us all on the call that we are whole people. And with respect to being whole people, as we consider the pathways we want to take in our careers. It's not only about the risk with respect to the work itself and what we do in the context of that environment, but also what it means for other aspects of our aspects of our lives. So how does what you want to do fit in with other aspects of your life? Let's say family life, for example, in terms of your, you know, your trajectory and how, how are you going to integrate those? Because they're really not separate issues. I'm gonna pick on John for just a minute and, and to say one of the things I, I've learned from John uh, um, you know, over the years is I really had a chance to watch John move through the academy, but to do so with a family, uh, with two really brilliant kids, one that is particularly spunky and um, a, a wife, uh, a partner, who is pretty amazing uh, to move to Arkansas is uh, and to rural Arkansas is not an easy move. So having uh, that particular support was important. So the negotiations not only go in and on in the job place, and this is a point that we always forget. It also goes in on in other aspects of your life because um, you know that has to come together in a lot of ways to give you. The, not only the intellectual space, but the emotional space to do the labor on the job. So I just wanted to, to point that out as well. Yeah, life is long. Life yeah. is long. So, you know, if you're focusing on your kids right now, life is, life is long. You have time to do different things at different points in, in your life. Yes. Thank you very much, Jennifer, and thank you uh, very much to all the panel members. It was a really great panel, and we learned a, a, a lot about uh, social change and social justice and uh, what's happening in the real world. So thank you. Um, let me also thank uh, many people. So many people worked very hard in order to make this workshop happen. Um, so first of all, the Simons Institute and Shafi, the director of the Institute, and the great staff that helped us a lot, uh, Ashley and Drew, and also Lily from Haifa University. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank, of course, to all the speakers, discussants, moderators, uh, of course, the leaders of the breakout rooms who worked really hard. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to, to my great uh, co-organizers, uh, Niva elkin Koren and Shafi Goldwasser, and especially I should say to Inval Talgam Cohen, who has been the main engine behind all this workshop uh, from its inception. Uh, it was great working together. And finally, many thanks to all the participants. Thank you for all the notes and for all the interaction. It has been uh, really great. Uh, let conclude with a final um, poll, uh, just like we did in the first day. So let me share my screen and it will take one minute. So please just scan this uh, barcode into your cell phones. If I forgot someone, please, I really apologize. Okay, can we start? 
Let's start. So what's your main takeaway from this workshop in a tweet mode? Listen, what do I do if I'm on a phone? Okay, lost in translation. We need structure. Exciting challenges, deep questions, conversation, more people. Technical is not enough. Algorithmic design matters. Teaching, teaching is the main, is the main challenge. Okay, more and more is coming. Of course, the limitations of each discipline Yeah, we heard a lot about representation. Wow, there is someone here who says uh, they need, they have uh, so much to learn from lawyers. <laughs> okay, so let's go on to the second question. Uh, what was the main challenge in this workshop in one to four or one to three words? <laughs> yeah. Time, language, long hours, <laughs> late hours. <laughs> yeah, we have a winner here for sure. Wide range of disciplines. Yeah, okay, time repeats also in the small ones, so. If we had a classification algorithm here, we would have had time even bigger. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, and okay. So answers are still flying in. Ah, too much time. Okay. <laughs> Great, and the last question. How likely is it that our April meeting will take place in person? <laughs> so now we are applying uh, now casting on Hellstar. <sighs> okay. Well, a bit pessimistic, but uh, we'll see. Great, so on this happy note, um, I would like to conclude. Thank you again to all of you for your participation and uh, really hope to see you in April in Berkeley. And thank, thank you, you Michal. Michal. Thank you, Michal.